Hello and welcome to lesson six of our issues and debates in psychology looking at holism versus reductionism. Right, let's get into it. So um, what we want to do today is, well, looking at the spec is that you need to know the levels of explanation in psychology regarding holism and reductionism. You need to know the difference between biological and environmental uh, re reductionism. Out of this, I want you to understand uh, that is to describe the key concepts in the holism reductionist debate. So you need to know what holism and reductionism is. You will need to discuss examples of scenarios using the holism and reductionist debate. And then you need to evaluate the reductionism holism debate. So here's our do now. In attempting to understand how a car works, are we best advised to look at the individual parts or to see the car as a whole system? So if you want to understand a car and how it works, do you want to try and look at the smaller parts, like the engine, the steering wheel, how it all interacts with each other, or do you want to see the car as a whole system? So it's more than just the, the sum of its parts. The car is all the different parts working together. What about a human, though? Um, can you do the same thing? So if you wanted to understand a human, do you look more so than at um, the, the mental aspects. Are we gonna look at the different systems that are going on with here? So your, your central system, uh, do we wanna look at uh, the different hormones that are going on? Like, how do we understand exactly a human? Is a human just, you know, chemicals that are interacting with each other in the brain or are there more things at play here? So uh, this is where we're gonna look at Gestalt. Now, uh, this is, referring to a, a group of German uh, researchers working in the 1920s and 30s. They're known collectively as Gestalt psychologists. They famously declared the whole world is uh, it is greater than the sum of its parts. And this view is the basis for holism, uh, which is the idea is that any attempt to break up uh, behavior and experience is inappropriate, as these can only be understood by analyzing the person or behavior as a whole. Uh, it's shared by humanistic psychologists who saw successful therapy as bringing together all aspects of the whole person. So this is what holism is. It's the idea that you, you can't separate it. You can't separate human, that it's, it's actually inappropriate to do so. You need to analyze the whole person. Well, the whole behavior. So when taking into account, uh, or when you're talking about a holistic approach, it means that you're bringing together all the aspects of the whole person. You can kind of see it's the, the spiritual side, it's the social side, it's the behavioral side. It, it is humanistic, so it very much belongs to the humanist approach to psychology, and it uses a lot of qualitative methods so we're not interested in getting all this data and breaking things down. We want to make it uh, more about the experience. And the only way you can get that is, is through the person. And I mean, it is Aristotle who did say this. Uh, the whole is, I, th I think it's Aristotle. The whole is greater than its parts. This is something that Gestalt psychologists uh, would say. I think, I think it was actually the whole is greater than the sum of its parts was what Aristotle said. Okay, so that, that, was, uh, that was holism. This is reductionism. So reductionism, I mean, it analyzes behavior by breaking down its, you know, into constituent parts. So you can kind of see, you've got you're understanding a watch, you break it down to all its different gears, and that's how you understand, uh, how you understand a watch. So it, it tries to understand humans by, by the simplest explanation. Uh, this is known as uh, parsimony. The, that all phenomena should be explained using the most basic or lowest level principles. And, and this is often the, the simplest and most economical level of explanation. I, again, think Occam's razor. I think I talk about that in a little bit. So uh, an example of this, to, and I think to help you, a person might go to their doctor with symptoms of depression 
The doctor might prescribe antidepressant drugs to try to control the activity of neurotransmitters such as serotonin in the brain. This would be a reductionist approach as the patient is seen as a biological organism with an organic illness that is caused by an imbalance of serotonin. The uh, explanation for depression is reduced down to the level of biological explanations and those of you who have done OCD and depression would already know this. Uh, a holistic approach would involve instead trying to find out more about the person and the background to the actual problem. This would in in include looking at their you know, physical health, not just their physical health in general, but what is their work life like? What is their social circumstances, their family issues? And you, you understand that before you decide a course of therapy. It's not, oh, you're obviously having some issues with your neurotransmitters. Here, I'll give you some uh, you know, serotonin uh, inhibitors. It, it's, it's not going to work. Um, they are more about finding out what is exactly going on. And the, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual uh, is a multi-axial tool that looks at patients' of physical condition, social and economic condition when diagnosing. So it's quite holistic in that sense. So within this idea of reductionism and holism, there are levels of explanation in psychology. So there are differing ways of viewing the same phenomena as we just saw in our example. So because there are different examples, uh, there are different levels of explanation and the behavior can be explained at different levels. This is why it's a debate. Okay? So social and cultural, psychological or biological. This is, I mean, this is why we have debate. And again, another example that we can look at is OCD. So different explanations will understand it from uh, across the different spectrum. So you've got your micro, which is looking at, at the, the smaller parts and macro, taking the whole the grander scheme of things that are going on. So perhaps, uh, you know, the reason why OCD is seen as the, the problematic is because society views it as odd. So it's a social cultural context. But if we go down level, we go down another level uh, to something a little bit more specific, you can see that it is psychological level, which is obsessive thoughts. Okay, getting more narrow. The physical level is a sequence of movements involved in the washing of hands. Getting even smaller than that is the physio, uh, physiological level, is it? physiological level, which is a hypersensitivity of the basal ganglia, which is a part of the brain, which is involved in OCD. And then you look then down all the way down to the neurochemical level, where it is, oh, it's an underproduction of serotonin. So what's the problem? Is it from seen from a societal perspective? Is it uh, of the thoughts perspective, the movement, the part of the brain, or the very specific activity that's going on within those parts of the brain, um, which is happening in between neurons? Uh, okay, so psych psychology, again, yeah, like there's all these different ways of seeing it. And psychology itself can be placed within a hierarchy of science. You know, you got, you got sociology, which is... Uh, more of a branch of psychology, which is a branch of biology, which is really a branch of physics and chemistry, which is a branch of maths. So, you know, you're more precise at the bottom and more general up the top. So sociology is looking at society. Psychology is looking at the person. Biology is looking at what's going on within the person. And physics and chemistry is what's going on within the biology and biological aspect. So... Researchers who favor reductionist accounts of behavior would see psychology as ultimately being replaced by explanations derived from those sciences lower. So, you know, in terms of OCD and we're looking at the behavior, but then, oh, no, that can be explained through looking at biology, which then can be explained through looking at chemistry. So, you know, if you've got your fields arranged by purity, you've got a little comic here where everyone's comparing themselves to each other. So you've got the psychologist going, oh, Biology is just applied um, psychology, and psychology is, and the biology is going, well, psychology is just applied biology. And the biology is, uh, the chemist is saying, well, biology is just applied chemistry. And the physicist, which says, well, that's just applied physics. It's nice to be on top. And then you've got the mathematicians all way, 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 way at the top there who's, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys over there. So you can kind of, kind of see that there's a bit of a joke there that mathematicians are the, the kings, apparently. So, um, biological reductionism so here we go uh, as you can see i've got the picture of the clock with the gears so human beings are and this is biological reductionism important for you to note this is that uh human beings uh, it, it's based upon the premise that we are biological organisms 
made up of physiological structures and, and processes. So all behavior at some, is at some biological level and can be explained through neurochemical, neuropsychological, evolutionary, and, and genetic influences. So it should be possible to reduce these things down to those neurophysiological components. Um, and and it, it is an assumption of the biological approach is that um, there is a bit of an advantage. So it, it leads to the application of concise and concrete concepts, which are then susceptible to scientific methods of research. So it, it, it's it's more scientific. So it is, yeah, yeah, um, that's what it is. So, I mean, I, I guess the assumption of biological approach is that it is being successfully applied to a number of different topic areas within psychology. So you can see the example of psychoactive drugs in the brain, have contributed much understanding of neuroprocesses and the fact that it might be possible to explain serious mental disorders such as OCD, uh, depression, schizophrenia at the biological level, which means that it's, oh, so look, it's more scientific. So here, here's an example. So schizophrenia is thought to be caused by excessive activity uh, of dopamine, right? So evidence of the importance of dopamine in schizophrenia comes from, in part, the discovery that antipsychotic drugs that reduce dopamine activity in the brain may also reduce the symptoms of the disorder. So have we got a cause and uh, effect established? And thus, schizophrenia is thought to be controlled by drugs. And this theory, therefore, de-emphasizes the importance of environmental factors. And instead, you know, it's actually the biological aspect, which is what is causing the disorder. So that, that is your biological viewpoint. The environmental, I mean, yeah, it is a bit different. So the behaviorist explanation suggests that all behavior can be explained in terms of stimulus like response. And I think of this as a bit of behaviorist, you know, it, it's built on environmental reductionism. As we saw in year one, behaviorists study observable behavior only. And in doing so, they break complex learning up into simple stimulus. So you're responding to links that are measurable within the laboratory. Uh, so, you know, it can be reduced and that, that again is, is using a scientific approach. You know, the key unit of uh, analysis occurs at the physical level. The behaviorist approach does not concern itself with the mental. So we're not interested in terms of what's going on within. We're looking at just the behavior. The mind is like a black box. It's irrelevant to our understanding of behavior. And in fact, the, th the thought itself is just was seen by, you know, John Watson as a sort as a, as like a, a sub vocal or silent speech. Right, so it's like you're talking to yourself uh, in a way. That's what that's all thoughts are. It's just it's just a dialogue. It's not. It has nothing really. It's not really that important. Um, so it's it's characterized. I mean, by physical movement, the same as other behavior. So if we're going to look at this again, uh, you've got attachment. So according to behaviorists, attachment is determined by classical and operant conditioning. So with the former. Um, classical, the person feeding the infant comes to produce a conditioned response, which is pleasure through being associated with food, which is your unconditioned stimulus. And with the latter, the person feeding the infant becomes a secondary reinforcer because she, he is supplying food. Yes, guys can uh, actually spoon feed babies. It's okay. Uh, so guys aren't going around breastfeeding babies because uh, he or she is supplying food, which is in turn a primary reinforcer, reducing an unpleasant hunger drive and thus rewarding. So uh, let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of the different positions. So if we're looking at uh, a holism, one of the strengths is that there are aspects of social behavior that only emerge within a group. So uh, think of, uh, in particular, the Stanford prison experiment, which um, I will talk about actually when I do a video essay on this topic. It provides a more complete picture by accepting and dealing with the complex nature of behavior. Uh, pa participants in the Stanford prison experiment could not be understood by studying the participants as individuals as uh, it was the interactions between the people and the group that was important. So you, you can't look at the individual people because also these people were not exhibiting any sort of forms of aggression prior to this experiment but then when you throw them into that circumstance and you take in the whole picture that is when you see what is really going on here so behavior is influenced then by many factors so holism may be more useful 
there are some downsides to holism, though. Um, it is not as rigorous as scientific testing and it can become vague and more speculative as they become more complex. It's difficult to investigate. See, to investigate behaviour and the biology part, to reduce that is easy. It's easy to reduce that stuff, but it's, it's difficult to broaden it because when you broaden things, uh, it becomes susceptible to other factors and other influence, and so therefore it is not as precise. It is a hypothetical. It lacks empirical evidence and is seen as a loose set of concepts and it neglects the importance of biological influences. So, again, I mean, you could take on the diathesis stress model, but again, uh, to a degree, that is also reductionist because it looks at the biological cause and then a stress. It's not looking at the whole picture. It's, it's getting more broad, but it is, it's not quite there. You got reductionism. So let's look at the positives of reductionism. It is consistent within scientific research. It breaks down uh, target behaviors into constituent parts, and that makes it possible then to conduct scientific experiments. It has a high level of predictive power. It gives credibility to psychology as a science. So if you're able to, you know, if you're able to create a theory, predict it, and then prove that, that makes it far more scientific. It is easier to explain in con concrete and concise terms. So for me to go out, I can point to stimulus response that is far easier to understand than the holism, which can be quite broad and very vague. Uh, the downside to reductionism, though, is that it, it actually may oversimplify complex phenomena and lead to a loss of validity. So if you're looking at OCD, again, uh, you could have different causes and effects going on here, which you might be dismissing because you're only focused on one particular neurotransmitter. Uh, biological explanations of genes, neurotransmitters, or neurons don't include an analysis of social context. So it ignores, like uh, holism reduce, uh, ignores the uh, biological aspect, the biological aspect ignores the social aspect of what's going on outside the person. And then the physiological process may explain how, but not why, a behavior is happening. So to draw attention, uh, you know, uh, for example, raising your hand, like in, in class, you could be raising your hand to draw attention. It could be an act of aggression. It could be part of another action that you're doing. So your physiological can explain how this happens. It explains how the, the arm is being raised, but it doesn't explain the why. Holism, on the other hand, would. And reductionism explanations can only ever form part of an explanation. It doesn't show the full picture. And that's the problem with reductionism. So let's look at it within context then of the different approaches. So you've got your social learning theory to start off with. And your social learning theory is quite holistic. Uh, the reason why is it looks at the behavior of the individuals in a social context. A, you know, group behavior, you've got your conformity or your de-individualization, and that may show characteristics that are greater than the sum of the individuals, which compromise it, uh, which com uh, comprises it, I think. Yeah, comprises it. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, what this means is, is like the Stanford Prison Experiment, it may show characteristics that are greater. So if you want to look at the group, what is going on within the group, because when you focus solely on an individual and you ignore the circumstances, then you're not going to understand the behavior. Uh, and it, it is interactionalist. It has a, a bit of both in that regard. So it, it does use principles to explain behavior in that sense. But it is, so it's not entirely holistic. There is some reductionist parts, and that's why it's interactionalist. Remember, interactionalist meaning it's a bit of both. Uh, remember that from the uh, nature versus nurture. So there's a bit of both going on there. Uh, then we look at your behaviorist approach, which is reductionist, because it, you know it reduces complex behavior to a series of stimulus response links. Easy, done. Cognitive is is also quite reductionist in the sense that it sees human as little complex information processes. So remember, think of the computer analogy, and it ignores the you know role of emotions in a way because it's all about what is going on in the mind. What, what are the thoughts that are going on there? How is it being processed? Uh, and you know, it uses the principle of machine reductionism to understand this. So it's not like it's um, 
going too broad, it, it again is focusing on just how is this information being digested. Biological, as already discussed, is heavily reductionist uh, as it explains behavior through looking at the role of genes, hormones, etc., which are small, easy to understand. You already know this, it should be quite easy for you to know. Then we have the psychodynamic. Wonderful Mr. Freud's iceberg. He definitely had a reductionist viewpoint because he explains all adult behavior in terms of what happened in childhood. So what events, so like this particular small event explains this behavior. It's not looking at the larger picture and the larger things. It's just what is going on within these, these stages of development. I mean, it could be argued that Freud does adopt an interactionist approach and that he considers that behavior was the result of interaction between the id ego and super ego, that there's this dynamic interaction going on. Uh, so he does take a more broader approach, I suppose, than the others that we've seen uh, because of the fact that it, it's not just these smaller necessary single events he's looking at. He's looking at more so interactions of different parts, which then plays out across multiple events, which then leads to uh, you know, these, these, these issues. So I guess that's why it is seen as more interactionalist. Okay, so then you have your humanistic approach. Your humanistic approach is when a person can be understood as a whole. So this is probably the most holistic one. Thoughts, behavior, and experiences should not be reduced to small component elements. It's illogical to, because you know you need to see the whole person to actually understand how a person can cope with psychological problems and everything else that's going on. So uh, humanistic is very much the holistic driving force. And then you've probably got your social uh, learning theory, then probably uh, following that is Freud. And then you will have your behavioralist and biological viewpoints there as being the most reductionist. So overall, the approach taken, the reductionist or holistic, should be appropriate for the behavior being investigated. So if you're studying memory problems, it might be useful to reduce this down to a biological explanation, such as a lack of consolidation. But if trying to understand what a person is thinking, reducing thought to action of neurotransmitters uh, might not be valid. There might be some other things that are going on. So this is which leads to the, the final thoughts, which is reductionism in psychology is, is useful. Okay, it is useful as sometimes the simplest explanation is the best, and that is Occam's razor, if you're familiar with philosophy. Uh, Occam's razor is the idea that the simplest explanation is uh, ideally the most accurate one. So, yeah, I mean, if we're going to look at... Um, I don't know if I can give you some weird example. Um, perhaps why, uh, I don't know, like, okay, so you guys know I've got a, a slight addiction to Coca-Cola. If you're, if I've got a Coke bottle on my desk that is half drunk, you could make the theory that, oh, um, the most likely explanation is that Sir has probably drunk that. Or someone else might go, well, no, 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 it, it's actually secretly some pixies that are flying around the room that are hiding themselves every time someone looks away and is secretly stealing some of it to make it look like that Sir has been drinking the Coke. Obviously, that's a, a ridiculous example, but you can see one is more simpler than the other. So, hence why the simplest explanation is the, most, is the best. You've got your physiological um, approaches tend to be reductionist, but as long as we bear these limitations in mind, it, it is difficult, uh, not impossible, um, to take a completely holistic approach to psychology as human behavior is so complex. It, it is so broad, so difficult to understand when you're wanting to just look at neurotransmitters. So it does make sense to look at human behavior from a holistic approach. Case studies, I guess, come closest to taking a holistic approach. I mean, if you saw my video on, about Ted Bundy, you would have seen that I, I do try to look at various things that are going on. Is it the relationship between his mom? Is it something to do with uh, his resentment towards women leading perhaps from his poor dating? Is it, um, you know, I, I look at all these different debates. Was there a biological issue going on here? Perhaps it was his, his problems were predetermined. So 
yeah, you, you can take it from a holistic approach. And this is why case studies are so good, because they use so much evidence. So, so much evidence. Uh, it makes it difficult, though, to explain behavior, uh, because it is, uh, it's, it's a form of anecdotal evidence, really. And explaining behavior in a reductionist manner is seen as a low-level explanation, whereas a more holistic explanation are high-level explanations. That is my final thoughts on this. Which brings us to some homework. So, distinguish between holistic and reductionist explanations of behavior. That should be rather easy. Uh, outline why some psychologists favor reductionist explanations of human behavior. That should be quite easy for you to do. That's, that's the easy part. This is the harder question, though. So, to discuss to what extent the cognitive approach is reductionist. That might be a bit trickier. Um, feel free to change it up, and if you want to go even harder, go discuss to what extent the psychodynamic approach is reductionist. And that's where we're going to leave it for today. So uh, hopefully uh, you managed to get something out of this. If I know I'm talking quite fast, so please take your time to pause, to go back if you need to. Uh, check out Simply Psychology's uh, webpage on that. I think it's like they just did a couple paragraphs. Over, overlooking this if you're still not too sure. Otherwise, the textbook is there for you as well. Uh, until then, that's very loud. Until then, I'll see you in the next video.